Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and so grateful to have a place to talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting people of goodwill and good faith. If you appreciate what we're doing here, I am so glad. We're grateful to have you listening and engaging. And if you are digging what we're doing, drop me a line. Give me a shout. We're on all the socials. I'm even on Mastodon. (laughs) So if you could share our posts, comment, like us, that all really helps spread the word about what we're doing and talk of politics and religion without killing each other. And today we're doing what we call in the podcast biz a feed drop. That's when we share an episode of another show on our feed. So what we're sharing this week is a great conversation my pals over at the Village Square were having. If you don't know about the Village Square and all the great work they're doing, you really should. They're super easy to find at villagesquare.us. That's villagesquare.us. As Liz Joyner, the founder, and Vanessa Rouse, the executive director, say, Village Square is a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that dialogue and disagreement make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. (laughs) You might remember we had Liz and Vanessa on the show a few months ago, and now I'm actually collaborating with them on their podcast. Sneak preview, If I definitely encourage you to subscribe to the Village Square cast. Really easy to find in all the major apps, Apple, Spotify. Uh, It's Village Squarecast, and Squarecast is one one word. So the sneak preview is I'll even be hosting their program now and then. So it's it's a great relationship. They're fantastic friends that we're getting to know each other even better and finding all different ways of of helping each other and collaborating in this important work. So the conversation you're about to hear is called Bridge Building and Bipartisanship. It's with Pierce Godwin, founder and CEO of Listen First Project, Kristen Hansen, executive director of Civic Health Project, and the Village Square's very own Liz Joyner. But Vanessa does a great job introducing everyone, so I'll turn it over to Vanessa and this wonderful panel. The call to other, the call to engage in us and them thinking, and the idea that yes, somehow, the 70 million of us on this side of the ledger were completely virtuous and right, And the 70 million or so on the other side of the ledger were completely and just inextricably wrong. I that math didn't work for me. And that's been uh, a guidepost for me in this work. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Square Cast. This is Vanessa Rouse. Thanks for joining us for Bridge Building and Bipartisanship. This episode is part of the Democracy Group's midterm series. In the midst of this divisive election season, we're excited to take a pause to chat with leaders in the bridge building field about the outlook for cooperation across political differences and potential improvements on the horizon that we can all reach for. Our heroic guests make a plea to average Americans to roll up our sleeves and show our politicians the way. Speaking of the politicians, Stay tuned until the end to learn about the Common Ground Scorecard, where you can find out which candidates on your ballot are interested in bridging divides rather than participating in the divide and attempt to conquer approach that many others are taking these days. All right, so today our special guests are Pierce Godwin, founder and CEO of Listen First Project, where he leads the collaborative movement of more than 500 Listen First Coalition partner organizations to heal America by bridging divides. And we have Kristen Hansen, Executive Director of Civic Health Project, working to reduce toxic polarization and enable healthier public discourse and decision-making among our citizens, politicians, and media. Also joining us is Liz Joyner, our founder and president here at the Village Square. 
I had to twist her arm to be here as my wing woman. But I think it's really important that she joined on too because, you know, she's been involved in the bridge building field since before there even was a field. All right, funding for this program was provided through a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Let's get to it. All right, so we are here on Village Squarecast with two very exciting guests. We're so glad to have you guys here. Pierce Godwin, the founder and CEO of Listen First Project, and Kristen Hansen, executive director of Civic Health Project. Thank you for joining us, Pierce and Kristen. Thanks for having us, Vanessa. Thanks so much for having us. Honored to be here. And let me also mention that we have Liz Joyner here, the founder and president of the Village Square. Liz, thank you for being here. I'm a tag along. Just yeah. wanted to be a part of the conversation. Well, really, you know, you three are such incredible forces in the bridge building space. So you're the perfect trio to talk with us about bridge building and bipartisanship. And so uh, this is part of the Democracy Group's midterm series. And we're so thrilled that they assigned this topic to us because it allows us to look forward to the future and think about some positive developments that are happening. Uh, so we're, we're thrilled to be here with you guys today. And let's jump right in. First, because, you know, bridge building can be such an, an inspirational thing. It's really, you know, uh, a happy place to be as opposed to, you know, being angry all the time. And so I would love to start with what, what really inspired you both to get involved in bridge building. Tell us about your background and then how you got involved in this work. Pierce, would you like to go first? Sure. You know, I'm doing this work because uh, I had a rather extreme example of what we're encouraging everybody across the country to do. Step outside of our individual silos, hang out with people who don't look like us and think like us. Uh, for me, a uh, Southern conservative white Christian guy, um, I went over to Uganda, which is not the same as North Carolina. Um, that was the first half of 2013 and went over there for six months with a Christian International Relief Organization to do some relief and development work and certainly, you know, found it to be a life-changing, perspective-opening experience for me. One of the things, as, as we all note, um, in some parts of the world is the abject material poverty. Yet, I was repeatedly struck by this incredible relational and spiritual wealth. That didn't crystallize for me vis-a-vis -vis America until I was on an overnight bus ride about to come home, not come home to DC where I'd been for the four years prior, but come home to North Carolina, my home state, bless your heart, we all get along, all is good. Uh, but that summer of 2013, I was seeing national headlines that we were at each other's throats right here in North Carolina, right here on Main Street. The vitriol was reaching a fever pitch. And I thought, in light of that six month experience I just had in another part of the world, what the hell am I coming home to? In the most materially prosperous nation in the world, I'm seeing abject relational poverty, just the opposite of what I'd experienced in Uganda. Note that was 2013. In many ways, that may seem quaint today. We might trade in 2013 if we could. It's only gotten worse. But on that overnight bus ride, I got myself all stirred up on what we in America were doing to each other. Jotted down some thoughts on what I thought would be a little blog post called It's Time to Listen. Next thing I knew, it was in papers all over the country. And I thought, well, gosh, why don't we try to do something about it? And that's how Listen First Project was founded. I love that so much. And it, it seems so simple, but it's not what we're kind of hardwired to do is we want to get out there and talk. We want to convince people. We want to tell them what we think they should know, you know, and um, just that simple listen first. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And you've grown so large. It's really impressive, Pierce. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to find so many other people out there who have had their own personal moments where they said, this is the mission I want to give my life to. Absolutely. Speaking of personal moments, for me, it came a little bit later than Pierce's. I'm a bit of a cliche because like a lot of Americans, for me, the 2016 election was a real wake up call and uh, surfaced differences and uh, distinct worldviews and perspectives within the country that I had not fully appreciated 
were out there. In that sense, I guess I've come to see the 2016 election as a bit of a gift because the fact that those differences were there was something we all needed to know and understand better about ourselves and about our country. And we talked about listening first. And I think that's kind of the first reaction I had was to recognize that there was a lot I didn't know or understand about what was going on in the United States, about how Americans were feeling about each other. But there was a welling up sense in me that the level of acrimony that was being surfaced along with these differences of ideas, differences of perspectives, was perhaps the, the deepest worry, the deepest reason to feel concerned. And so recognizing that we had surfaced these two fairly different Americas and that hostilities were rising between them, between us, became my North Star in terms of the work that I felt called to do from that point forward. And so I stepped out of work in the private sector and uh, moved into the bridge building field, launching Civic Health Project as an organization that focuses on building up and amplifying this field and fortuitously finding Pierce and Listen First Project pretty early in that journey. That's fantastic. It's striking that you guys really come from different backgrounds, but you decide both came to realize that this was really important work for very different reasons, but here you are and working together. And then here's Liz, who also is in your whole network. So Liz, tell us how you guys all met and how you work together now. Well, so I remember, um, gosh, I don't know what year it was, Pierce, but Pierce just called me or reached out to me. Late 2016. He just has this way about him that is warm and open and inviting. And he just jumped in and he met um, all the people who were in the field that, that was growing substantially at the time. And I, you know, and I would say it's, I don't know, or I don't remember how long you and I have known each other, Kristen, maybe a couple of years. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that one of the things that I want to say about both of them, and this maybe isn't a surprise is they are absolutely, um, determined, indefatigable, advocates for what they do. It comes from their very core every single moment of every single day. And I have gotten the, you know, had the real pleasure to see them both uh, personally do things that make me so optimistic um, at a time that it's pretty hard to be optimistic. I mean, we've been, we've been doing this work at the Village Squares for 16 years now. And at the beginning, we were kind of not totally all alone, but sort of all alone-ish. And it has just been a joy to see, um, you know, Pierce and Kristen as just really true national leaders grab a hold of this very, very big job. And, you know, and, and I've seen sort of the, the world kind of turn on its axis a little bit. It might be interesting for listeners to know that Pierce and I come at this work from very different political backgrounds and geographic backgrounds and perspectives. I'll share my own and hopefully Pierce will as well. But uh you know, I am a kind of a classic Midwestern progressive in that progressive Wisconsinian tradition, live out in California now in the Bay Area, where I am a, a true Bay Area liberal snowflake. I'm kind of triple blue in the sense that my family, my friends, my social networks, my political environment, everything and everyone bleeds blue. Uh, and so it has been tempting at times to shift or move into a more partisan frame in terms of addressing or tackling the problems as I see them in this country, but somehow I always find my way back to bridge building and the desire to forge connection, insight, understanding, empathy with people who have different political perspectives as I can't help but resolve it this way. The only path forward, the only path forward for this country and how we resolve some of our deep divisions and some of our most compelling problems as a country. I know Pierce is going to share some stats in a bit that'll put all of this in a little bit more bold relief, but maybe first, Pierce, you know, share share where you come at this and how did you become my my brother from another mother where the <laughs> difference is that your mother's Republican and mine's a Democrat? <laughs> my, my mother has Fox News on loop and your mother maybe not. Um, <laughs> MSNBC all the way, baby. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I started my, uh, my story in Uganda, but, um, you know, I, I think 
uh, a real driver, perhaps determining factor um, in my own passion for this work were the four years prior, right after college, when I went up to DC and worked on Capitol Hill, and then North Carolina saw fit to fire me after six months when Senator Elizabeth Dole lost re-election. But then I was doing voter micro-targeting, this fancy big brother data analytics stuff uh, to determine the right voter and the right message. And that was all for Republican campaigns from some states for Romney to literally every voter in the 2010 midterm cycle. Um, and I still very much, you know, uh, am am conservative and have those conservative values and principles. Um, I love politics. I've always loved the game. I've always loved the horse race. Um, and, you know, speaking of it being quaint in 13, it really feels like when I was there from 08 uh, to 12, even, you know, we, we weren't enemies. We weren't, you know, hating each other, at least the people I knew and, and, and the way in which, you know, the people I knew were approaching their work. It was more of a competition of ideas. Um, it's what makes democracy so awesome and this experiment so grand um, is that competitive um, spirit of ideas and, and then of electoral politics. Um, so I come from the belly of the beast in DC and in National Republican uh, Consulting and I'm honored to have had that experience. Don't regret um, a day of it um, and still hold so many of those principles. But with that experience uh, in Uganda, just like Kristen's wake up call in 2016, it was like, all right, I've got all these principles. Like they aren't going anywhere. I still believe passionately in these things and we don't need to all agree and sing Kumbaya. That's totally boring, but it feels like there's something else going on at the cultural and the societal level that compelled me to spend more attention to that. And, and, and the, the fact that um, our competition of ideas and our democracy and this incredible, exceptional nation isn't going to endure if we tear ourselves apart from within. There were a couple of things that that struck me and compelled me when I made that transition from my private sector background into this work in the political bridge building sector. First and foremost, I was just confronted by the simple fact that if you looked at the results in 2016, and of course this played out again in 2020, in terms of Americans who spoke with their votes, we broke down pretty evenly. About 70 million voting American adults lean one way and about 70 million lean another, right? And that is a fact we cannot ignore. So whatever our leaning, we must contend with all those millions of Americans who lean the other way. The other thing that compelled me was to see the competition of ideas becoming so intermingled with vilification, condescension, the whole emotional layer of how we were grappling with our differences that just didn't sit right with me. The, the call to other, the call to engage in us and them thinking and the idea that yes, somehow, the 70 million of us on this side of the ledger were completely virtuous and right, and the 70 million or so on the other side of the ledger were completely and just inextricably wrong, I that math didn't work for me. And that's been uh, a guidepost for me in this work. The starting point for all of us has to be that politically, ideologically, in terms of our worldviews and perspectives, lots of us lean one way, lots of us lean another, let's deal with it. And let's continue to treat each other as fully human as we grapple with those differences, right? Amen. He just kind of nodded at me and said, last day school, mommy. And that was the last time I ever saw him. The front desk told us that we couldn't visit him. He's a ward of the state. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, host of All About Change, a podcast showcasing individuals who leverage the hardships they faced to better the lives of others. I always had a place to escape, but this was something that was unraveling in front of 23,000 people. Listen to All About Change for a dose of hope and inspiration. Man, you guys are both brilliant. This is making so much sense and um, we're all doing a lot of nodding over here. This is fantastic. So Pierce, summarize, give us some information on, on exactly what the problem is. Where are we today with our divisions? Yeah, I, I love starting with uh, two of my favorite people, Vanessa. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, quoting Jesus, said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And they weren't playing. More than half of us right now, 54%, say that our fellow Americans pose the biggest threat to the country. 
just like Kristen was talking about, they aren't, you know, of a different perspective or a different background. No, 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 no. They're a threat and it gets worse. This toxic polarization has been described as a singularly virulent and dangerous phenomenon and our greatest national security vulnerability. Now, as we can all see around us, as it's hitting close to home, nearly all of us, 87% recognize the threat. 71% in my mind rightly conclude that our democracy itself is in danger. Here's some of the scarier stats. 35% of partisans now believe violence could be justified to advance their party's goals. 61% say they are concerned that the U.S. could be on the verge of another civil war. 43% believe it's at least somewhat likely in the next decade. And 14% of our fellow Americans, that's a whole bunch of folks, believe that another civil war is, quote, very likely in the next 10 years. Today, research from Pew and others tell us that and we all think that they, whatever they is, whoever they is to you, us versus them, just like Kristen said, they are our enemies. They are a serious threat. They are downright evil. Now, one of the measures that, that many of us kick around, especially around the Bridging Movement's Goals and Measures program is what's called this feeling thermometer. So academic word, affective polarization, as Kristen outlined, we don't just disagree, we dislike, dehumanize, distrust, each other. So there's this 100 point thermometer that's deployed every four years by the American National Election Studies and also by Pew and others. How warmly or coldly do you feel about, you know, those people, the other party, right? They started this in 1978. Republicans rated Democrats at a 48. Um, and Democrats rated Republicans at a 46. They're near the midpoint. All right, fine. We're like lukewarm. No problem. Let's keep up that good, healthy competition of ideas. Even as recently as 2000, Democrats rated Republicans a 41 and Republicans rated Democrats a 38. All right, like maybe put on a light jacket. It's getting a little chilly, but, but not all that bad. But most recently in 2020, ratings from both sides plummeted halfway to zero over just those two decades. Democrats now rate Republicans a 20 on this 100 point thermometer. Republicans rate Democrats a 16. 48% of Republicans are now giving Democrats a zero on that thermometer. It's a nearly 600% increase from just 2000. And 39% of Democrats now give Republicans a zero, a 3x increase from 2000. One in five Americans say that many members of the other side, quote, get this, lack the traits to be considered fully human. And 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats say the country would be better off if large numbers of opposing partisans, quote, just died. Wish they just die. I mean, we've got to get a grip on ourselves. I don't know when the last time murderous rage ended well for anyone. Let me give you just a little bit of international uh, perspective here as well, that experts who've witnessed sectarian violence break out in countries around the world are sounding the alarm right here. We work with a number of these folks who say, you know, we've dealt with the toughest conflicts from Northern Ireland to, to South Africa and so many other places and then realized their backyard, as we all realized on this call, was burning. They're begging us to grasp what this once exceptional nation could become. And we get it. We know Americans across party lines say that division in the country is the most important issue. They rank uniting the country as the most important national priority. Yet, and I'll end with this, as warnings about toxic polarization and calls for reconciliation grow louder, Liz and Kristen and I keep hearing all these different folks of varying backgrounds and beliefs respond with something along the lines of, oh, but hell no, not with them, mm -hmm. right? There's this massive amount, as we've already talked about, of distrust, fear, and contempt coursing through our veins. It can make engaging with the other seem certainly distasteful, but even disloyal. Liz talks about this all the time, disloyal to our own values and in-groups. We all want to belong. And even stepping out there to have these kind of conversations can make us feel ostracized and threaten that most basic human need. But to those who reject this idea, of engaging across differences, I earnestly ask, what's your end game? Kristen touched on one of these. I've heard four answers, which I love alliteration, and so I'll shorthand them as delusion, doom, duck, and dash. 
many of us believe, as Kristen touched on, we behave as if one day we're going to somehow vanquish the other side into oblivion. We're not going to have to contend with them or their values anymore. As Kristen said, that's a, at least 70 million folks. Like, good luck with that um, in the great experiment, the pluralistic society that is the United States. That's delusional. You're not just going to get rid of those people. They're not just going to go away. It is is not at all thought through, is it? Like, no. I, I really don't think anybody stops to think, well, you know, if I want them gone, how is that going to happen? It, it just, it won't and it can't. No, it, it, it absolutely can't. So that's, you know, being a little mean here, but I call that delusional. Uh, others, you know, have given up hope in light of all the stats I share. They've given up hope. They do think, as those 14% do, that we're irrevocably destined for another violent civil war. I characterize that as doom. Some have forsaken civic engagement of any kind and secluded themselves with only family and closest friend. They're just ducking down. And finally, I keep running into people, and it always surprises me, who have actually have thought through their own plan, and it's to get the hell out of Dodge. They have a literal exit plan with them, their wife, whoever, to go to this, that, or the other country um, as things get worse. So we're in big trouble. But it's time to get a little hope up in here. So I'm here to say that there is hope. And I think hope is found in Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs crossing their lines of difference to spend a little time together, to see humanity in each other, to identify shared values, and to work together to fix things they broadly agree are broken. We have talked about this tension that on the one hand, many of us recognize and feel deeply concern about the level of division, acrimony, animosity that is uh, present in our country right now. And yet there are forces that keep pulling us into a frame that is not conducive to bridging, to reaching out across whatever chasm, whatever fault line divides us. We might perceive ourselves as being disloyal. We might seek out the safety and security and validation of our own tribes during a time of high economic, political, climate, you name it, all sorts of uncertainty. So there's this tension that we're all grappling with. And we did promise to give everyone some hope. Um, before we go there, I find it useful to just diagnose the, the situation we find ourselves in a little bit further. Pierce did share a lot of scary statistics. Well, how did those numbers decline and deteriorate so rapidly over these past years and decades in our country? At Civic Health Project, we talk a lot about this being kind of a perverse supply and demand dynamic, where you have to look at both sides of the equation. Let me break this down very quickly. I'm going to start with what I call the demand side, which is the idea that all of us as humans, we decide. We decide what to gravitate to. We decide who to interact with. As consumers, as citizens, we express our preferences in what we feel, what we say, what we believe. And there are complexities in our innate wiring as human beings that can inhibit us from being our best selves, our, our braver angels, <laughs> to cite one of our uh, esteemed colleague organizations. And that is that those temptations to think in simplistic us and them terms, to other people with whom we're less familiar, to seek out the safety, security, and comfort of the tribe. These are all things we need to be aware of as elements of human nature, but, but elements that we can surmount, we can overcome. And if we're concerned about division in our country, we're going to have to overcome. We're gonna to have to get over some of these comfort zone issues that keep us um, divided from others and connected only to those with whom we deeply, deeply agree. So that's kind of the demand side of this pattern that we have to become aware of if we hope to break. Then there's the supply side. And it can be tempting to just point to the supply side alone and say, well, the reason we're so divided is because of politicians, because of media, because of social media. And I will, I will acknowledge that there are perverse incentives on the supply side that make it very, very rewarding for some entities and individuals to constantly focus on dividing us. And there are mechanisms that make it easier than ever. Um, you know, disinformation travels around the world faster than truth can get its pants on, right? Social media amplification makes it easy to get vilifying, condescending rhetoric out there. And then that condescending, vilifying rhetoric in turn can be weaponized by the other side in order to point fingers and blame the person who propagated it. Might've only been one person, 
who said the vilifying thing, but now 70 million people have heard it. And so, yes, on the supply side, there are all sorts of dynamics that make this a hard pattern to break too. Becoming aware of all of this, being insightful and feeling empowered as Americans that we can break the perverse supply and demand loop is how we start to get ourselves out of this crazy situation and, and begin to reverse those terrifying statistics that Pierce shared. But it does require for all of us as Americans thinking about how are we going to how are we going to shift those demand preferences within ourselves? I deeply believe it starts with every one of us as individuals and then how we express ourselves in our interactions. And then how can we as consumers and citizens change our demand preferences so that those incentives to divide us, divisive rhetoric, divisive strategies just aren't as effective anymore because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to be divided from each other. We don't want to give you our eyeballs, our outrage, our money, our votes, because you have told us that our fellow Americans are terrible. Right. Well, you guys have really done an excellent job pinpointing the problem and explaining to us why it's just so important to get involved. We really need we need the bulk of people to get on board with this so that, um, you know, we can just drown out some of the divisive. And when I talk to people, you know, I hear them just tune out when we start talking and then it's almost like you have to wait, hang on, hang with me just a second, because this is different than everything else you're hearing in that space. And so, and then they get interested and then, and sometimes I even feel like we got to prove it to them a little bit like, oh, it sounds too good to be true, but then, hey, listen to a podcast episode, come to an event. And then all of a sudden they're going, wow, I didn't really even know this was out there. So, um, yeah, you guys just what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Now, I would like to ask, um, have Liz chime in here because Liz, you have a unique vantage point here as a person who noticed these problems 17 years ago before, you know, many oh, of us. It's it's really incredible. I just try to put myself in, in those shoes because I'm certainly a lot more uh, recent to the space. I kind of have a similar story as you, Kristen. But I just find it completely fascinating, Liz, that you you diagnosed this way back when, and thank God you started working on it then because um, you really found an effective model. Um, but tell us what you have seen in the bridge building space over this time, over these 17 years. Well, let's just start with a point that I really wish I had been wrong, um, but apparently I was not. Uh, and it's been a very interesting thing to be doing this work at the same time as, as really we could feel here in Tallahassee doing our work in the Village Square, we could feel what Pierce and Kristen just described. We could feel it getting heavier and harder. We could feel the eliminationism kind of rising. And, um, you know, to your demand side point, uh, we could feel actually as more people identified that this was a really serious problem, we could feel actually the demand go down, ironically, because it is so difficult and hard. Um, and so we'd have to sort of redouble our efforts to kind of put, to increase the demand. And like you say, Vanessa, is, you know, make people kind of excited about being in the space. At the same time, sort of personally, I was walking a walk where my um, my life was filled with people who didn't agree with me politically. And one of the things at the same time as I watched it, you know, get worse nationally is I was more and more convinced that I had learned all sorts of things from people who weren't politically similar to me, that that was just the very walk of democracy and that we were forgetting this incredibly big idea. Uh, but also we were very alone in the space. And so maybe there were a handful of organizations. And now I think one of the things I really want to convey to the people who are listening and worried is that there has been an extraordinary, you know, it's like the cavalry has started. There's like over 400 organizations in the space taking on all sorts of different aspects of, of the challenge. And both, uh, both Pierce and Kristen's organizations are very involved in the, the sort of central organizing and directing of the, of the energy in the space. But I also think it's, in, it's, it's so inspiring to think that we Americans are rising to this challenge. It isn't, you know, when you turn on the television, when you hear all the professional polarizers out there doing their thing, um, people need to also know that average Americans are putting down their day jobs, 
and doing everything they can do, working around the clock, and and it's it's really starting to show. So I think there's a lot of hope. Um, I like to call the whole movement sort of Tocqueville 2.0 uh, because we really are rising into the challenge of what it takes to be American citizens, and it's also what the cool kids are doing. It, it's great company if you can keep it. The best thing that's ever happened to me, you know, since that bus ride. Uh, in 2013 was realizing in late 2016 that I wasn't alone, that it wasn't just little old me in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, that there was somebody named Liz Joyner in an organization called Village Square who had been on this mission for years in the past. Um, Liz continues to be, you know, uh, most trusted sage and, and, and someone that I and everybody else in the movement go to because she has been doing the hard work so much longer than virtually any of us. To Liz's point, um, when I was thrilled to know that I didn't need to invent my own widget because other people already had and already knew what they were doing, uh, we founded the Listen First Coalition in the beginning of 17 with four organizations. Village Square was one of the four. And today, as she noted, it's just tapped 500. Uh, so it has grown explosively and there is so much hope in that. There's so much variety in the ways in which people can engage across differences. The ways in which, as Liz noted, people can put down their arms and say, I wanna be part of the solution. I wanna turn down the heat and find a way forward together. But such gratitude to Liz, Village Square, and the very, very few others um, who were doing this uh, at the very beginning, um, were the first to recognize this problem. The whole movement now stands on their shoulders. And I'm struck by something that Liz touched on, which is the idea that this is this is where all the cool kids are, or as I like to say, the, the market's coming to us. Uh, bridging divides, learning how to engage constructively across differences is becoming a thematic focus across American society right now in a way that is also just explosive. So while we've got hundreds of organizations out there that would define bridge building across our various fault lines as their primary mission, their reason for being. And those fault lines could be political, economic, racial, religious, geographic. Above and beyond that, the wider, wider civic sectors across America are really switching on to the idea that fostering and galvanizing norms, skills, and practices around bridge building really just it developing or strengthening a set of muscles that are being underutilized by most Americans right now is a lot of the challenge. And so whether it's organizations that help individuals to develop and cultivate these skills of bridge building, listening, um, perspective sharing, reflecting, uh, open-mindedness, intellectual humility, curiosity, all of these values and virtues that really support a more socially cohesive community or society. Uh, some organizations are really working on providing skills, tools, insights, and resources to individuals. Others are doing heroic work on the ground in communities, much like Village Square in, in the region surrounding Tallahassee of forging and fostering connections all across the tapestry of the community with intent to bridge these specific fault lines that otherwise can make communities feel very divided and very dysfunctional. And then you've got groups and organizations that are wholeheartedly focused on specific sectors. So they're working with congregations and faith communities, or they're working in higher education, or perhaps in the service sector. So volunteer organizations that have local or national operations, or in workplaces, in the corporate sector, in the nonprofit sector to imbue better awareness of the need for us to all cultivate skills of bridging differences um, at a very practical level so that our relationships and our work uh, can function better. But on a societal level, as we cultivate these skills in young people, old people, in their private lives and in their public lives, we can all also become better participants in this crazy American experiment, uh, experiment in self-governance. So I call it the win-win. You know, let's, let's do some self-help. Let's all strengthen those bridge building muscles within ourselves and cultivate some new skills of listening, curiosity, open-mindedness, humility. And then let's go out and exercise those skills as actors in the world to strengthen our civic health. You know, it's interesting as you're uh, talking, Kristen, I'm thinking of the fact that in a business, you would never say, let's just get a whole bunch of people together who agree with each other on everything. And then let's market our product. 
So it's like we know that as a culture that we need people who have different ideas, different backgrounds, different perspectives, and yet we're not really doing it in our civic life. And and it's it's joyous. It's like I feel like I could never go back again to a place where I was only talking to people who agreed with me because it's dull and flat and you don't learn much. Yeah, and you're unlikely to come up with the best solutions, right? I mean, this is one of the core concepts on which representative government is predicated. The fact that the best ideas emanate from the greatest diversity of perspectives. And we are definitely losing that train of thought entirely in this society where the messaging from the supply side and our inherent beliefs on the demand side are both saying, no, no, only my side has the answers. The other side wants to destroy civilization as we know it. How did we How did we move so far off the mark in terms of understanding that a diversity of perspectives constructs the best solutions? Right. Yep. I'm really glad you guys brought this up because I was having a very similar thought as I was researching you guys before this interview and um, realizing just how collaborative your work is and that it is very different from often a business mentality where everyone else is your competitor. You know, you guys are saying, you know, the way to do this is to work together and, and the more bring in as many as we can and all that and how appropriate for the bridge building movement to be that type of movement. So way to go. It's fantastic. Doesn't mean we always get along Vanessa, but we try. (laughs) That's a good thing. We try to practice what we preach. (laughs) We do. Anybody, including Liz and Kristen here, who knows me any Uh, even a little bit well knows the incredible irony in listen first. So we are all, we're all trying to to do a little bit better ourselves. And as Liz suggested, uh, look in the mirror, start there. I have a hard time. I can deal with the fact that Pierce's politics are different than mine, but I'm a UNC Chapel Hill grad and he's (laughs) a Duke grad. So I have a, I have some problems sometimes about that. (laughs) We we, we do. Deep, Deep breaths are required. I really want to emphasize how much, for me, bridge building feels like a practice in the sense that you never really get to the end of the journey. I liken it to yoga or meditation, you know, two things I'm generally quite bad at, but I try. And bridge building's the same way. I'm not sure you ever get to a point in your life where you say, okay, I have, I have surmounted all of my fears, anxieties, my sense of threat, my um, my tendency to close off to other perspectives. But like any practice, you can keep working at it. You can keep chipping away and inviting, seeking out opportunities to practice. And I think that's something I try to employ and embrace in my day-to-day life, not just in my work, but in my personal life as well. Where can I go? How do I find people who will both challenge my worldview and also give me opportunity to practice listening, perspective giving, perspective taking, contemplation and reflection, so that I can appreciate, learn from, and apply different perspectives to problems I have to go out and help solve in the future. Right. So practice, practice, practice. Even just thinking about myself, it occurs to me that what Kristen just described is critical because times, even as, you know, somebody, uh, given everything I have to this mission, I'll get myself all stirred up and my own intellectual and moral fortitude will hit 100%. I'm certain that that I am right and that whoever's doing whatever is absolutely batty. And if I didn't have people in my life, including, you know, politically speaking, Liz and Kristen here, um, who were opening my eyes to say, wait, wait, okay, there's another way to look at this. There's another perspective. There's another experience. There's a different set of values. Um, Okay. Okay, now we're talking about a disagreement. We're talking about a difference in perspective. Um, So I battle that myself to this day. And as Kristen was talking, I just thought, you know, if we aren't exposing ourselves ideally to those other humans, at least start with some other news sources, you know, complicate the narrative, uh, then we're, we're going to, I don't care how long you've been doing this, even I dare say Liz, if we get ourselves siloed enough we all those human banal things will stir up and we will get ourselves stuck in that toxic cycle of us versus them. We've got to be around fellow Americans unlike ourselves to keep our level heads. And a final point, I, I love getting to the practical. And, and Kristen was talking about this in terms of, you know, the reasons people might want to do this. Like, look, 
if you think this whole bridge building thing is is just kind of like kumbaya, wouldn't that be nice? Or unfortunately, to Liz's point, uh, the demand having this 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 awkward countervailing force right now because it just seems too hard, too impossible, too pie in the sky. It's just not going to happen. All right, fine. I'm talking to you right now. <clears throat> Are you passionate about something? Do you want to advocate for something? Spoiler alert, as Liz suggested when, when talking about business, if you want to persuade anybody of something, if you want to grow the coalition for whatever cause it is you're passionate about, you've got to listen with curiosity. You've got to understand where your detractors are coming from. You're not going to grow a coalition. You're going to keep talking to your own little choir and accomplish, sorry, nothing sustainable if you don't have an understanding of those other perspectives. So if your only mission in life, God bless you, thank God we've got people so passionate about particular issues, you are going to be more effective. I would argue the only way you'll be effective is to engage with folks who don't see it that way. And that's gonna allow you to be more successful in advocating for the change you seek. Right. Well, let's build on this how part because I think that you know a lot of people hopefully are bought in by this point that this is what we should be doing, but how when we're all living in our silos. And um, so I wanted to point out that Kristen's voice might sound familiar to our listeners because uh, Kristen was on our September 22nd episode where she interviewed uh, she was a facilitator for Dr. Rob Willer, who uh, had a presented it on how to have better political conversations. And so that conversation was just jam packed full of great practical suggestions for how we can do this. Um, and then you also, Kristen, you recently worked with Dr. Willer on the Strengthening Democracy Challenge. Can you tell us right. what that is? Right. Well, Pierce and I have talked a lot today about this exploding movement, and so has Liz, and the fact that there are hundreds of organizations and now a lot of traction within communities and various sectors of our society in fostering and, and forwarding concepts of bridge building. At the same time and in parallel, a, a large community of academics and practitioners has been fixated on this question over the last couple of years of whether there's any. Are, are there any hacks, basically? Are there any things we can do that are quick and easy and accessible and scalable that could help to equip everyday Americans, young and old, more quickly and easily with insights, tools, resources, skills that will make us better bridge builders? And this culminated in a massive social science study experiment called the Strengthening Democracy Challenge. Uh, one of the unique features of this study was that it was based on crowdsourcing submissions from anyone, anyone anywhere in the world could submit. Academics, practitioners, students, um, someone in their basement could submit a short, as in eight minute or less, online intervention, something that a person could do online, read, write, watch, pledge, and so on, that might um, be expected to have some kind of impact on them that would reduce, let me emphasize, reduce their levels of partisan animosity toward the other, reduce their support for anti-democratic attitudes and behaviors, and reduce their threshold or tolerance for political violence. So the aim was to reduce um, Americans' propensity to support any of those things. And out of 250 submissions received, 25 were selected by an expert panel for a full battery of testing by over 32,000 Americans. Over 32,000 Americans wow. participated in this social science study. And there are two really hopeful outcomes I want to share with listeners. The first is that out of those 25 selected submissions, 23 of them, 23, moved the needle on people's perspectives around partisan animosity democratic beliefs and behaviors, and support for political violence. So that's really good news. A second finding that was hopeful is that a wide variety of approaches worked. A wide variety of approaches worked. So there's really rich material now for academics and practitioners to work with to take these insights and scale them out. And some of them will hopefully be scaled out online and continue to be out there as short online approaches and interventions exposing more Americans quickly, easily, accessibly to bridge building. And others are concepts that can also be applied in the ways that practitioners engage with Americans 
in more intensive hands-on ways in physical interactions, workshops, panels, conversations, dialogues, and deliberations. There are insights that we can apply. And I'll just give one example of an insight from that study. It's around this notion of correcting misperceptions, correcting any American's belief about what other Americans think about them. So remember we talked about this adverse feedback loop a little while ago where one person posts something vilifying and then it gets amplified and then 70 million people think that 70 million other people are vilifying them. Some of the most successful interventions were breaking that cycle by explicitly correcting misperceptions. So for example, if a Democrat tends to believe that Republicans hate all Democrats, it's very easy to dispel that misperception and vice versa. And you can do that in a very short amount of time. And just that level of insight can help lower the heat among Americans to think, oh, I I thought all Republicans had this really negative perception of me, or I thought all Democrats had this really negative perception of me because I am the other. And that is not so. And I just heard a whole bunch of Americans tell me it's not so. So that's an example of a type of intervention that can work in a short amount of time. So very hopeful. And hopefully lots of applications of this will come out. But in the spirit of offering quick and easy things that people can do, if you're feeling inspired right off the end of this this podcast, I want to first reiterate what Pierce said about um, drawing news and information from multiple sources. Sometimes in our work, we call it flip your feed, flip your feed. If you tend to get all your information from left-leaning sources or all your information from right-leaning sources, just mix it up. If you watch MSNBC, Try a few days on Fox, vice versa. If you tend to read left-leaning media, read right-leaning media. Can't, and there are organizations that can help you with this, like All Sides or The Flip Side or The Factual that make it very easy to flip your feed. Um, also, go on Citizen Connect. CitizenConnect.us is a fabulous resource for everyday Americans who are looking for easy ways to get engaged in cross-partisan socially cohesive work. Many, if not all of the organizations and the events and activities being hosted have an explicit bridge building focus. All of them are focused on strengthening our system of self-governance in healthy cross-partisan ways. So citizenconnect.us. And here's another simple thing. Is there a relationship you've lost because of politics, a family member, a friend, a college roommate, a former coworker? Try reaching out. Try reaching out. You don't have to reach out about politics, but just reach out and reconnect and and see if you can forge that friendship. So that would those would be some immediate thoughts that I have for everybody who's listening. Simple first steps you can take. You're going to find this gets pretty addictive. And like yoga or meditation, uh, this can become a practice that you really embrace in your own life. Very therapeutic. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you went to the action oriented things that we can do right now. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Kristen. All right. So Pierce, before we got started recording here, we were talking a little bit about the scorecard related to the upcoming midterms. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it might be helpful as we decide who to vote for? Absolutely. I know it is that time of year. And one of my favorite partners is Common Ground Committee. They developed a couple of years ago what they call the Common Ground Scorecard. It provides an objective, easy to understand assessment of the degree to which elected officials and candidates for office embody the spirit and practice of a common grounder. They define that as someone who seeks points of agreement and solutions on social and political issues through listening and productive conversation. So your listeners, as they're considering their votes among certainly other issues, should absolutely go to commongroundscorecard.org and see how their current representatives and candidates and challengers for those offices fair. We've actually reached out to all of those challengers for the House, for the Senate, for gubernatorial races. Uh, 30 of them uh, running for seats across the country have affirmed the Common Grounder commitments, intense 10 commitments expressing an intention um, to be that kind of elected leader. Um, 26 of them have vowed to take the kind of personal actions that the scorecard um, credits within the first six months of office. Those are things like having a conversation across political differences, being a member of a Common Ground focused caucus. There's several in the House one in the Senate, Uh, and then also talk about stepping outside of our comfort zone, going physically to the district 
of a member from another party and visiting, walking in their district and, and seeing what life is like there. So that and many other things, including official performance while in office in terms of bill sponsorships and co-sponsorships and also communication around Common Ground are taken into account. But commongroundscorecard.org, uh, encourage folks to, to check that out and to consider it in your voting decisions for these midterms. That's fantastic. I'm so glad to know about that personally, um, because for me, what's risen up to the top and characteristics I look for is really integrity and the willingness to put our country above our own personal um, needs. And so it's really hard to determine that. But like right now in this divisive time, it's almost like, you know, going the other way, you essentially have to go against the grain of your party and if you're willing to do that, you're showing me that you have the integrity <laughs> to lead in the way that I want you, that I'm going to want you to lead when you're there. And to me, that rises above most of the other things that we're arguing about. Also, because I've had this shift in realizing that, you know, all these things that seem like we're a mile apart on, we're really not that far apart. We're really, really way closer on the issues than it than it seems if you listen to the it's so there. true, Vanessa. One one neat little feature of the scorecard is identifying people, to your point, who are what Common Ground Committee calls mavericks. So we all know that a lot of our districts across the country these days are heavily skewed one way or the other, right? The preponderance of voters are Republican or they are Democrat. So that, to our earlier conversation on incentives, incentivizes that representative to just go all in on one side or the other and play to the base. So what we're really excited to see on the scorecard are when somebody is representing a district that has an above average partisan skew in either direction, yet has an above average score on the common ground scorecard, call those common ground mavericks. So those people are defined, to your point, Vanessa, they have the integrity to defy their own electoral intentions and say, when I get there, I am going to stand for working across differences, for moving things forward together. That's amazing. You just stated that way better than I was trying to, but Mavericks, I love that. I'm going to use that. That's awesome. All right. Now, Pierce, uh, any kind of closing words that you have for us today and how can we get involved and, and be part of this movement? Yeah, you know, to the point of what we can all do right now, uh, Kristen, Liz, and I have seen many different sets of tips and tools, and they're all wonderful. I've really become partial to three Boiling, boiling them all down. And for me, it's listen with curiosity, speak from your own experience and connect with respect. So if we just go into every conversation thinking, how am I gonna listen? I'm gonna listen with curiosity. How am I gonna speak? What am I gonna talk about? Am I gonna regurgitate what I've been hearing um, from you know, my own team, my own uh, captains in media or otherwise? Or am I gonna speak from my own experience? Am I gonna tell my own stories? And then finally, how are we gonna connect? We're gonna connect with respect. Those are the three after looking at everything out there that we boiled it down to for some of our larger scale you know, national events. And they're the three that I try to work on myself every single day. You know, to see the work that is happening uh, across the 500 plus folks now in the Listen First Coalition, go to listenfirstproject.org and check out the coalition, check out their individual websites. There's an offerings page that outlines those offerings. To Kristen's point, Citizen Connect does a beautiful job of showing you what specific events are coming up um, across the movement. And then on that listenfirstproject.org website, if you wanna simply sign the pledge, I will listen first to understand, you're gonna be in the loop with this entire movement. You know, I think America's warning lights, as we've articulated on this call, are blinking red. You know, the question is, what will you, listener, do now? I give you a lot of scary stats, but thankfully, 79% say that given the opportunity, they would play a part in reducing social division in America. Will you? I think mean, we, the people, have an urgent choice to make. Are we gonna continue fighting against our fellow Americans or are we gonna fight for America? Will you show up for each other and for the country we love? It starts with bringing your voice to the conversation and listening. And that's beautiful, That that's beautiful. And I've come to think of that as step one to solving all our other really big problems. Yes, ma'am. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pierce. You're really an inspiration. And I'm so thankful that you changed your whole life around to do this here as well as Kristen and Liz. Liz, do you have any closing thoughts for us? Um, only that when you do what Pierce is so beautifully and eloquently describing, it's it's so much better on the other side. It really is. It's like it's like you see it in stark relief. You're you're happier. You're you're fuller. In, in some ways, we're sucking ourselves down this hole of our own making accidentally. You know, in some ways, just because of how humans roll, right? We 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 tend to be groupish, and you know, the internet has made it so that it's really easy to be groupish. But it is, you know, it, I just invite our listeners to come come with us. Come on the other side of this. It's just so much better here. And, you know, you're less angry, happier. You see people um, more clearly as their unique uh, individuals. And also, I want to say thank you to both Pierce and Kristen, who really are truly my heroes. And we're really lucky that we have people who are who don't need to sleep a lot um, to be uh, have their shoulder at their wheel at this wheel. Excellent. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you being here and giving us all some hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Village Square. Thank you. Thank you for having us and leading the way, Village Square. Hey, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this program with Pierce Godwin, Kristen Hansen, and Liz Joyner. These civic superheroes and the organizations they lead are doing incredible work every day to reduce toxic polarization and save our democracy. Listen First Project leads the collaborative movement to heal America by bridging divides. They elevate the impact, visibility, and voice of the bridge building field by aggregating, aligning, and amplifying the efforts of 500 Listen First Coalition partner organizations into large scale national campaigns and strategies. Together, these organizations transform division and contempt into connection and understanding. Learn more at listenfirstproject.org. Civic Health Project is dedicated to reducing America's toxic partisan polarization and enabling healthier public discourse and decision making among our citizens, politicians, and media. Through grant making, advocacy, and events, Civic Health Project supports the most promising research and interventions to reduce political division and foster social cohesion across the country. To learn more or donate, visit civichealthproject.org. And to stay up to date on all the latest happenings here at the Village Square, subscribe to our newsletter at villagesquare.us. While you're there, please consider becoming a member by clicking on that donate link at the top. Our members help us deliver critical democracy-saving programming to you year-round. We offer individual memberships for $76 a year or business memberships for $250. Go to villagesquare.us slash donate to join today. Funding for this program was provided through a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We're grateful to them for their support. And we're grateful to the Democracy Group for producing this midterm series to put a spotlight on what's at stake here during the midterms. Check out the whole midterm series for more great discussions from the other podcasts within the Democracy Group. Also, thanks to you for joining us for bridge building and bipartisanship. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon. And thank you so much for listening to Village Squarecast. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. 
You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam. Thank you.